Well, hello, and thank you for listening to the Chiropractic Research Podcast Series. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I am a clinical faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University. And I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Thanks so much to all the listeners of the podcast out there. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, thanks for joining in. I really appreciate all of the great reviews on iTunes and the feedback from you all. If you like listening to the podcast, please leave a great review on iTunes so we can attract even more chiropractors to listen to the best in chiropractic research. I read all of the feedback that I get, and I wanted to share one with you from iTunes. It's from Dr. Brian Call. He said, the podcast literally inspired me to get a PhD so I could research the brain and help out the chiropractic community. I love this podcast. Well, thanks, Dr. Call, for letting me know about your plans to become a chiropractic researcher. Uh, this is amazing, and it's, uh, it's a part of why we do this podcast. So thanks again, Dr. Call, and thanks again for everyone for listening. I also wanted to let everyone know that I've created a PowerPoint slide presentation for patients that is now available. The presentation provides snippets of educational information from the chiropractic and related literature from 200 peer-reviewed articles. 40 of which are from 2016. You can check out sample slides and get a more detailed description on the chiropracticscience.com website. As you may know, my goals for producing these research interviews are to get the word out about chiropractic research from the experts that are actually doing the research, to encourage collaboration of researchers, and to motivate and assist practitioners and students alike to pursue research careers in chiropractic science. I'd also like to point out that chiropractic science has partnered with chirocredit.com to make these podcasts possible. Well, let's get on with the interview today, and that is with Dr. Mitch Haas. Dr. Haas has been an integral member of the research division at the University of Western States since joining the faculty in 1987. He is now the Associate Vice President of Research at UWS. Dr. Haas also serves as an adjunct associate professor in the neurology department at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Haas has been either principal investigator or co-investigator on more than 30 extramurally funded grants, bringing more than $7 million in research funding to UWS. In 1994, he was a co-investigator on the first federal research grant ever awarded to a chiropractic college. Dr. Haas has since become the principal investigator for a number of large federal grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health and Resources Services Administration, and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. These collaborative projects with OHSU and other institutions were designed to evaluate pain and disability outcomes and cost effectiveness of chiropractic and medical treatment for low back pain, a chronic pain self-management program in the elderly, the research, the relationship of the number of chiropractic treatments, with health outcomes for low back pain and headaches, and care of low back pain in adolescents. Dr. Haas has been active in state and national public health associations. He was the founding chair of the chiropractic healthcare section of the American Public Health Association, and has since served as chair of the APHA Intersection Council, a governing counselor, member of the APHA Executive Board, and chair of the APHA Bylaws Committee. He was also the 2007 president of the Oregon Public Health Association. Dr. Haas, it's an honor to have you on the Chiropractic Science Podcast. Absolutely my pleasure to be here. Great. So um, you just by reading your introduction, there's uh, an amazing amount of information there. Uh, you've done a tremendous amount of research and been an integral, integral player in um, a lot of important uh, avenues for chiropractors, including the public health. So I want to talk about all of these things uh, during our interview today. But first of all, could you tell us how you became interested in becoming a chiropractor? Sure. I, I think I had a story similar to many other people. Uh, I had a basketball accident when I was a senior in college. I I guess I ran into the center and power forward of the opposite team, and one of us fell down on his back. And years later, I was uh, trekking in the Mount Everest region of Nepal, and I was staying at a 
friend's house out in the mountains. And one day I woke up and I could barely walk. Uh, what I know now to be, and I had an SI joint problem. And I wrote a letter to a friend in Kathmandu, the capital, uh, saying, God, I sure could use a chiropractor. And the letter got there, a miracle. <laughs> uh, second miracle, a letter actually got back. <laughs> and it said, Mitch, I ran into a chiropractor in Kathmandu. And I managed to get back to Kathmandu on a, I think I managed to get a ride on a Swiss development helicopter. And I got back to Kathmandu and I uh, uh, tracked uh, the chiropractor down. And um, he treated me and we got to be friends. And I said, gee, you know, you could become a chiropractor. You could be a physician and, uh, and uh, you know, do good work and be a nice person. And I said, hey, I'm at a crossroads. I'm going to go to chiropractic college. And uh, I did come here to Western States. And uh, he taught and was an administrator here uh, until just a couple of years ago when he retired. That's terrific. That that might be the coolest chiropractic story I've ever heard. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> helicopters and all. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. So cool. Um, so you, you, uh, were you in practice for some period of time or did you go straight into research? How, how did that all take place? Uh, that's another interesting story. <laughs> After I graduated, I, um, I, uh, I did go into, uh, pri I had a private practice on the side uh, briefly, so I, I wasn't in practice for more than a year. But um, what happened was, is while I was waiting to take uh, uh, the um, boards here in Oregon and California, I um, was uh, you know, teaching some biomechanics and the like, and one day the research director came up to me in the hall and said, Mitch, uh, we want to write a grant proposal. We need a chiropractor. Um, I can't get anybody else, but you come highly recommended. And uh, I kind of looked at her and said, uh, do you remember who I am? Because uh, I almost let a strike against her research methods class. Uh, but um, she goes, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we started working together. And... Uh, we hit it off and uh, worked together for more than a dozen years. And uh, that's how it started. So basically, she offered me, you know, I just got a little bit of money. She might have had a $100 or so, and uh, but still being a recent graduate, you mean positive cash flow? I'll take it. <laughs> and that's how I started in research. <laughs> that's so cool. So did you do your master's degree as you were working for the school, or or did you do that before or after? I did that before. Okay. My master's degree is in physics, and I um, I got a bachelor's degree. Took a year off, traveled, went back, uh, and then I I had changed. I guess is the best way to put it. And I I left a, a PhD program after two years, and they tortured me for a couple hours and gave me a master's degree. <laughs> and so that was that was. Uh, in 1978, okay. then I went into the Peace Corps, taught physics in Nepal, and then uh, um, decided uh, to come to chiropractic college so after doing some other things. So I ended up coming here in 1983. Wow, really neat. Now, you've authored numerous publications in a variety of excellent peer-reviewed journals. Uh, during this interview, I'd like to talk about several of these papers as well as discuss your interest in the public health, as I mentioned. So uh, lots to talk about. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, one of the areas that I think uh, at least other researchers like myself have come to know your work uh, well is through the work that you've done on the dose-response relationship between chiropractic care and, and various outcomes. So I'd like to spend some time learning about some of these studies, if, uh, if that's okay with you. And um, so... The, the first paper uh, that I wanted to talk about was in the Spine Journal in 2014, um, 
Would you mind uh, going through uh, this paper? This was the one about uh, 400 participants with chronic low back pain, and they were randomized to 0, 6, 12, or 18 sessions of manipulation. Okay. Um, dose response became an interest of mine because, you know, like all us chiropractors, uh, you, know, you learn in school, you know, something like, three times a week for two weeks, two times a week for three weeks or whatever. And, but, you know, no one knew for sure, you know, how many visits to a chiropractor were necessary. And this, of course, is, has obvious um, import to practicing doctors and their patients, as well as um, um, insurance companies that will pay for this, um, you know, for our treatment. But it also has, an, you know, importance for research because when you compare let's say spinal manipulation to something else well the, the big question you have is well did I choose the right amount of, of, of treatment you know to in other words I want to put my best foot forward I want to compare optimized chiropractic care to, um, to uh, either a, a placebo or some other alternative uh, care so I started working on this a very long time ago with some very small grants from some alternative medicine centers funded by NIH, and um, we collected some pilot data and uh, decided that, uh, you know, we should look at a range uh, somewhere. I figured the, the best would be somewhere between, uh, I'd say, 8 and 18 visits, somewhere somewhere like that, or probably between 8 and 16 was our best guess. But for the purposes of, of research, you want to have something with none. You also want to have something that's a very low dose, which, you know, if that works fine, then, you know, that's what would be optimal for patients. And then you want to have a little bit at higher doses past a little bit where you think um, the optimum will be, you know, to see if uh, it stabilizes, you know, the outcome stabilizes, or even if there's a downswing. In other words, is there too much care that could be harmful to the patient? So that's why we chose that 0, 6, 12, and 18 visits. And this particular study was designed as what's called an explanatory study, or what used to be they used to call it a fastidious trial. And so this is in juxtaposition to a pragmatic study, which is more like things are in, in practice. And, you know, I asked people at NIH about that. I said, well, you know, you seem to really like these fastidious trials. Uh, you really need to do that to get funded, at least at that time. And they just looked at me and said, well, you know, we don't fund pragmatic trials. Now things have changed. Now they're starting to do that. But at least at that time, we had to have this fastidious trial. So it was designed where we could... Um, uh, people were randomized to, to everyone was randomized to eight to have 18 visits, but of those they were they would get either zero sessions with spinal manipulation, six, 12, or 18. At the other visits, they would get a, a light massage control. So in the same area that you would have adjusted, you're basically giving them, you know, just a, a really, really kind of like nice, gentle touch for. Um, you know, uh, an equivalent period of time to what you would do for manipulation. So the purpose of this was is so that we could isolate the effects of spinal manipulation. So how, what effect is there of spinal manipulation over this dose range um, after um, controlling for um, your time with the patient, so every visit was the same length, uh, touching the patient, and this... Um, you know, how you interacted with the patient. So we, you know, made sure that, uh, you know, the docs would, uh, would uh, treat the patients uh, the same way no matter what, you know, uh, dose level they got. So if they're an enthusiastic, bubbly doctor, just be enthusiastically and bubbly for everybody. If you're quiet and dignified, do it that way. Uh, so, and, and we were lucky in that um, it worked out and we actually evaluated uh, uh, patients. That's one of the other papers that we might talk about. But um, that was uh, well controlled. Now, 
having said that, there's a shortcoming to a paper like this, and that is there's, it's hard to compare doses when everybody is getting um, 18 visits. So it's like comparing 18 visits for spinal manipulation to 18 visits for a control, that's a lot of attention from a chiropractor. And as we all know, if you touch patients, if you talk to them, if you pay attention to them, there's going to be some kind of treatment effect. So what we at least were able to show was is that there was this dose-response relationship. The more treatment you got, at least up to 12 visits, um, you know, the more the, the better the outcomes were in terms of, of patients' pain and disability. And and actually the 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 effect size, the the amount of you know pain. So in other words, on a hundred point pain scale, uh, we had like seven or eight points, uh, but other studies wouldn't get much more than ten when they just compared uh, manipulation to let's say a placebo or a weightless control. So it actually showed that there was you know quite a bit of of you know proportionally shall we say of of influence of doing spinal manipulation on these chronic low back pain patients. Okay, great. So you you looked at pain, you looked at disability, were there were there any other measures that you looked at uh, how much medication or health status or or any other variables? Oh, we did we did tons of them. Um, let's see the um, Secondary outcomes included pain unpleasantness, uh, days with pain, days with disability, you know, in the prior four weeks, perceived pain change. Um, so uh, compared to when you started, uh, how much have you improved? Um, perceived disability change. We used the um, physical health status from the SF12, the short form 12 um, questionnaire and the mental health component from that. We used the Euroqual health, health state. And we also looked at um, uh, medication use to see if, um, if that changed. But uh, the biggest um, changes were in our primary outcomes in the pain and disability. And there was some noticed in, in some perceived uh, uh, pain change and even with days with pain. Um, and what was interesting to us is that you know, we evaluated the um, patient. We followed them up at the end of care at six weeks, and we looked at them at 12 weeks, 24, 39, and then 52 weeks. So basically at the end of care and then at um, 3, 6, 9, and 12 months of, uh, following uh, those patients. Uh, the best came out at 12 weeks. And that was really no accident because to get funded, you have to have preliminary data. And our preliminary study suggested that um, patients um, are, are, have their best outcomes at about three months after they start care. And um, so that's what we actually found. And, um, you know, in, well, at, at the end of care and, and, and also at, uh, at, at 12 weeks, what was a little strange is that at um, 20, actually we had 18 weeks in there too. At 24 weeks, the effects, the benefits of of of, of dose disappeared, and uh, so that was a little bit strange to us. But um, it it did seem to come back a little bit uh, uh, later on at the um, at the uh, very high, uh, I mean at the very uh, long follow-ups. So what we found in the sense is that, you know, starting with, you know, by the end of treatment, people have improved uh, what we would consider a clinically important amount. Um, the difference between groups increases a little bit. Uh, so your benefit uh, over the control group increases it to about 12 weeks. And then it kind of levels off, uh, you know, the, uh, the effects, the, except for maybe the control group, which uh, keeps you know, getting better. So what we found is uh, basically, you know, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that pretty much everybody improved from treatment. Uh, the bad news is that um, that included the control group, 
which had you know the light touch plus we used a a a quasi sham ultrasound now what we wanted to do is we know people like bells and whistles so to help and you know boost the compliance with care we wanted everybody to say hey yeah i'm getting treated because it's going to in, increase their compliance with follow up so the kiss of death for any study is people dropping out of the study and we wanted to um, keep them in for an, an an entire year and we wanted them to uh, comply with the treatment the 18 um, treatment visits in um, in six weeks and we were able to do that um, I'm not sure how much that um, that um, ultrasound helped and it was very very low low dose ultrasound so instead of continuous ultrasound that you would use for chronic pain we use pulse ultrasound uh, ending up using about 1 20th the dose that uh, is recommended but anyway, we managed to get, uh, you know, more than 90% of the, of the patients went to all 18 visits and um, at least 80%, 80 and even over 90% of patients uh, were followed up, you know, over that, you know, each of the, um, of the uh, follow-up periods, you know, up to a year. So it was, a, you know, a very successful study. And pretty much it was the first full-scale um, randomized trial uh, to look at uh, dose of uh, chiropractors. And what's interesting, I think, also is that earlier we did a very, very large observational study. And we found that chiropractors, in Oregon at least, were only treating their patients three to five times. And here we found that um, the best results for chronic patients were probably up around 12. Um, after that, 18 visits uh, showed really no additional benefit. So that dose response curve improved, improved to 12 visits, and and then just flattened out, plateaued. So, wow. Well, that... Anyway, so 12 visits. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that's uh, fantastic, and I really appreciate you going through all the details of uh, of everything with this particular study. Why do you think that? There aren't any other groups at this point that have really mm -hmm. given this uh, significant uh, consideration and started to do these kinds of studies. You know, I don't know. There have been a few that started up in, uh, in some other alternative medicine fields. Uh, but, um, no, I, you know, I've, I've never asked. Um, the, the current study that we're finishing up, uh, which is a dose response on cervicogenic headache, uh, we're just uh, gearing up to uh, you know, finish getting all the data prepared for the statistician, and we'll be doing the analysis soon. But um, that one we did in partnership with um, our colleagues in uh, Minnesota, who were at the time at... Uh, at Northwestern, and um, so we um, did. We recruited half the patients there, and half the patients here in in the Portland area, and uh, and you know they were. So that's that's the other school that uh, participated, you know, in a in a dose response study. Okay. Beyond that, it's all my little pilot studies and worked our way up to the big ones. <laughs> well. Well, thanks for doing them all because we really need it. Uh, <laughs> def definitely, uh, you know, just sometimes, you know, th there are these great ideas and, uh, and it's surprising to see that, you know, one, only one group is doing them. And so, uh, so thanks again, but uh, let's keep going on because we've got a lot of great other stuff to talk about. Uh, so w one of the next things I wanted to ask you about was the cost analysis related to this dose response of manipulation for chronic low back pain. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, this was probably um, a study that came out of the study that we just talked about, but correct me if I'm wrong. So, and that was published in uh, JMPT in 2014. Correct. Uh, it's the same study. Um, in addition to all the, um, the uh, you know, patient outcomes that we, we had for low back pain, we also collected uh, information on services 
that the patients used. And the, um, what we uh, did was we asked patients at all the follow-ups, you know, in the last four weeks, uh, you know, who did you see for, um, for your low back pain condition? And, um, you know, did you have any hospitalizations, any surgeries? Uh, what medications did you take? And through a very, very complicated algorithm, we, um, you know, put together, you know, um, you know a, a cost of care. So um, it uh, took in consideration uh, Medicare, um, relative value units, and all kinds of things. You know, just to, uh, the idea was to level the playing field in, in, in every possible way. And, and we did that also for that uh, big observational study and because we were comparing it to medical care. But in, in this case, uh, we still, um, you know, use the, you know, the same kinds of principles. And we have no time to get into those details here. But, um, but so we did that, but we added something else in there, and that is um, uh, lost productivity. So if people were off work, you know, if they stayed at home, then um, we um, use some standard procedures for estimating um, costs of, of, of lost productivity in the workplace. And so what was interesting is, is that we found that um, most of the costs that were involved um, were due to uh, lost productivity. And when it came down to... Uh, you know the, you know what we found here. You know to make a long story short, and the, the first thing is a good thing is that there was no difference in costs over the um, uh, over the uh, the different um, the different uh, what do you call it um, the different uh, uh, treatment groups. So costs stayed um, you know, uh, the same. In terms of uh, you know out of pocket insurance expenses plus the lost productivity, so you know at first we were a little concerned about that, but then when we uh, looked, we used different outcomes here. We looked at um, you know days free of disability, days free of of pain, and well, days free of disability, I guess is the uh, big outcome that we used here, and we found that um, what we have is is that there's a benefit of care. Uh, here again, peaking uh, at the uh, at the twelve uh, visits, and so you you get a benefit in terms of outcomes from that twelve visits, but it doesn't cost you, it doesn't cost the insurance company, it doesn't cost society any more, you know, for uh, twelve visits than six visits or even no visits. So you have, in that sense, a a cost effective. Um, uh, type of care, and so we were very, you know, very happy with that, and uh, so that was basically, uh, you know, the the gist, you know, the main take home from that uh, that cost analysis. And we'll do the same thing for this study that we're doing now on on the cervicogenic headache. So I look forward to seeing that data and see how it it compares, you know, how headache treatment compares in some senses to the low back pain treatments. Great. Well, we look forward to to reading about that and hearing about that. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, one of the things that strikes me as I hear you talk is, um, you know, oftentimes what I hear in the uh, in the media or amongst uh, some chiropractors in the profession is that many chiropractors over treat. Um, in other words, maybe more than twelve, more than eighteen visits. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear what you said about some chiropractors in your state seem to, based upon this evidence, undertreat uh, in terms of getting the best response and also in terms of uh, maximizing uh, a, a cost uh, for the treatment. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much hoping that <laughs> those chiropractors in our state will 
read this article and uh, and then you know, you know look at it. See, the the thing is, in practice, you're making your decisions, you know, as you go, you know, based on patient progress. But what was different about a randomized trial-like ours is that we didn't stop treating if patients, you know, seem to be getting better. So the chiropractors would do their, you know, their um, manipulation as long as they could find something to manipulate. We didn't, you know, we told them if there's nothing there, uh, then, you know, don't make something up. But if you can find something, anything you can find, even if they're pain-free, you know, see if that happens. In this way, you know, we can see that over a longer period of time that, um, you know, maybe you would have in practice just given six visits, but um, uh, that in the long run, the larger amount of visits um, probably had a, a maybe a more stabilizing effect, but uh, was able to give a, a better outcome for the patient. Now, again, there's always the caveat. This randomized trial says this is probably a good place to start. However, this is for your typical, you know, chronic chiro, you know, chronic low back pain patients, but you have to use your clinical experience to say, hey, this patient is different from the population that uh, we looked at, or this is this, or maybe it's the same population, but it always, you know, on average, you know, you're going to get this much better, but some people are going to do better, some people are going to do worse. And you have to use uh, um, experience there to, you know, guide you in what other kind of treatments you're going to do. Maybe I'll do more treatment. Maybe I'll see them a little longer. Maybe I'll see them a little less because this patient uh, seems to be somebody who's going to respond better. So in that way, you have to use that experience to supplement the uh, research because even if you gave me an infinite amount of money and an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of researchers, uh, I still wouldn't be able to give you all the information you needed to know to uh, treat your patients uh, optimally. It, it requires that judgment. So I just wanted to make that uh, you know, very clear. We're not saying go out and give everybody 12 visits like a robot. <laughs> right, yeah. right, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you already mentioned uh, a little bit about the cervicogenic headache study, uh, but I wondered if we could get into a little bit of the design of this, um, how you, I, I, it sounds like it was just the next natural progression from the kinds of studies, the dose response studies you've already been looking at, but can you give us a kind of a quick tour of your cervicogenic headache study? Okay, the cervicogenic headache study pretty much had the um, same design as the low back pain study, but with a few differences. One, we didn't use that, uh, uh, you know, very low dose ultrasound. Um, I was too worried that uh, it has too much of a of a, of a placebo effect, and um, that could mask, you know, the the actual magnitude of the differences between 6, 12, and 18 visits. Um, the other thing we did, and this, uh, you know, made the study a little bit more difficult. When, uh, you know, when you, you, you do different fields, there are just different peculiarities of, of how people do research. And in headache uh, research, it's pretty much the standard to use a headache diary. So we didn't have to do that in the low back pain, but f for this we did. And this means that you have, you know, bigger compliance problems because you have to get people to fill out a diary every day. So we'd have them do that for uh, basically four weeks. And then at the end of a four-week period, of a follow-up period, so we did it for six weeks for treatment, and then four weeks before the, the uh, 12, 24, 39, and 52-week follow-ups, you know, we'd, we'd have them fill another diary and then fill out a questionnaire, which could serve as a backup. And um, and so we then we'd have all have to collect all this data and, and convince people to actually do it. And we 
decided that we would do uh, three things. We gave people options. Uh, we gave them the option of filling out a paper diary, which they would mail into us. They could do it online, or they can do it um, through texting. So even though we're only asking three or four questions, um, you know, we we would um, you know be able to collect this data. Now we prefer doing it online or by texting because we would know immediately whether they were filling out, you know, the you know the diary or not. And then we can give them a reminder. And uh, we had some people that were very good uh, at, and very graciously, you know, reminding people that, uh, hey, uh, you got to fill out your diary or, you know, what's wrong? How can we help you? So we were able to uh, collect that data and uh, we were able to um, get the desired compliance level, you know, to, you know, to, to make this a a uh, credible study. The other thing, of course, is, is that this was a, a two-site study. Um, so, and and it was very mixed in, in how we did it. So here we did it the way we did low back pain. I had um, uh, ten clinics. Uh, um, so we had a, a campus clinic, but then we had nine or ten field clinics. So we were actually getting, um, um, you know, patients, you know, real. You know, patients that were treated in, in, um, in you know, live practice, which was uh, very important to us. In Minnesota, we did it differently. They had a, a huge research center there, and so they did all their treatment at the um, at the research center. And so there are some advantages and disadvantages uh, of of both. It's much easier to control the um, evaluation and treatment when you're doing it in one place. On the other hand, we got to see a little bit more um, uh, what it's like to be in actual practice you know, around the city of Portland. So that's pretty much how, how things worked out. And so they, uh, they are you know, basically very similar studies, but they, they had some you know, major differences. The other thing, though, is 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 that you know we we had to use the you know the two sites using uh, uh, Portland and, and the Minneapolis area uh, because the low back pain is everywhere, so it's much easier to recruit. So even though we recruited people over a number of years, uh, um, we still needed uh, you know more recruitment opportunities um, in. Um, by using the you know the two big sites. Plus, over time, you know the economy changes. Uh, so you know, when people are working, they don't have time to attend appointments. You know, the, you know that kind of a thing. So uh, uh, we also had to deal with new databases. The technology was changing, and then new requirements by the National Institutes of Health. So guess what, you guys, um, you're uh, you got to rewrite your protocols. You got to do this report. You're going to have site visits now every year, and, and so it was um, challenging, and we had to adapt as we went along. But uh, I could say one thing for sure: uh, running these large trials is like herding cats. <laughs> but it's 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 very challenging because you know you have to get you uh, field doctors to comply, you have to get patients to comply, um, you have to work with. Uh, with an institutional review board, a data and safety monitoring board, uh, the NIH program officer, and and your staff, the only people that you have, that, you know, you can de directly supervise. <laughs> so uh, let's put it this way: uh, uh, when you when you do these studies, uh, you're not going to be bored. <laughs> For those of you who want to be researchers out there, and, and and boredom is just not your thing. This is the thing to do. <laughs> I I. Did an interview with Jan Hartvigsen a little while back, and it cracks me up. Uh, he was saying that the chiropractors over there in Denmark, uh, when he first started out, that they uh, were calling him about two weeks after he started <laughs> on a study <laughs> to find out what the results were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, before Try we start, we we do uh, we do trainings with the docs. So we bring them in, you know, serve them a little food, and we go over the protocols. 
and you know answer questions and then we have you know a follow-up session and um, so yeah so our, our doctors are becoming experienced in in research and that's another way that people can contribute is, is that they can um, be part of studies um, as treating docs and and um, and uh, um, treat you know as assessors uh, looking for uh, eligibility for studies and, and follow-up um, examinations so there's always plenty to do without having to design the studies and and uh, and you know uh, do all that data collection there and everything. No, we did involve our docs in in design because we wanted to deal with you know their you know any issues that they had you know you know problems that they would face um, in practice. And we've been doing this for years, so it's always you know we're always um, changing that to, to you know to deal with changes in 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 their practice, changes in the law. You know the requirements uh, for documentation that they have and the like, but um, it's it's good when you can get a, a a small network of of chiropractors and and this being different from the you know most of the networks that you see now where uh, you know just treat the next ten patients and uh, of with low back pain and and we'll collect data on them. But you know ours was a very specific um, you know pretty rigid. Uh, uh, you know, randomized trial protocol. So, and then they're both very important kinds of designs. But yeah, but uh, yeah, those the guys in Denmark, Jan and 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 crew, they they do great work. And so it's it's uh, I always look forward to reading their publications. Oh yeah, fantastic. Well, I'd like to switch gears just a little bit and pursue uh, finding out about your experiences in public health. Um, how did you become interested in public health? All righty. Um, you know, it's, I kind of stumbled into it in almost the same way I stumbled into becoming a <laughs> chiropractor. Um, it just, um, one day the president of the college came by and said, we're trying to shore up, uh, um, chiropractors participation in, in the American Public Health Association. They were involved in a special interest group for chiropractic called the Chiropractic Forum. And they were also part of a, of a section, a full-fledged unit of, of the association. It was kind of weird. It was, it was a combination, it was called the radiological health section. And so it was a combination of radiation physicists and chiropractors. <laughs> and and they said, so, you know, they wanted me to present some of my works. And I said, sure. So I went and, you know, to give my presentation. I went to the meetings of, of the special interest group in the section. And a friend of mine want, uh, decided he wanted to become the chair of that special interest group. And I said, sure, I'll help you out. I'll be the secretary. You know, that's no big deal. And uh, the next thing you know it, uh, the senior members of the of the group said, came to me and said, Mitch, it's time for us to become a section. And I said, can you remind me again what a section is? And, <laughs> and then so all of a sudden we're writing this, you know, 30 page, or man, it's probably 50 page application. Wow. Uh, to become a section. The um, chair left, he went back home. He was, uh, you know, um, from another country. And then all of a sudden I'm, you know, the acting chair and, you know, reading a group, writing the application, and and then, um, you know, I came elected the chair of our, I think at the next meeting, and then we submitted our application, and then got, in 1995, got to make the motion for us to become a section on the floor of the governing council. And so I had a, a seat there, and next thing I'm chair of a section, and Chair, uh, a governing counselor, and and they started asking me to, you know, run for other things. So they said, uh, Mitch, will you run for the Intersectional Council Steering Committee? So there was a uh, council of 25 sections, all their leaders, their chairs, chair elects, the media panel. And um, they wanted me to you know, run for a position on the steering committee. And I said, what's my chances? I said, well, you're, you're running against one person. I said, well, since nobody knows me, you know, I'm brand new, uh, I, don't, I don't have to worry. 
I'll, I'll run as a patsy for you. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you, I, I did it as a favor because uh, staff had helped us out so much, you know, in, you know, dealing with the paperwork uh, and becoming a section. So they guided us through all that. So I said, okay. I'll run. And I won that election, I, I think, because nobody knew who I was. <laughs> and um, and then I, I had another, I became chair again of our, of our section, and I ran again for this intersectional council steering committee. And uh, this time I guess I won because they did know who I was, hopefully. And um, at that point, the governing council decided to make the... Um, the uh, chair of the intersectional council, a member of the executive board. So, you know, I had no idea that that was going to happen. I, you know, I walk in and all of a sudden um, I'm on the executive board <laughs> and appointing committees and doing more work. So it just never ended. So, you know, why did I keep doing this? And, and basically, I, I have to say, uh, you know, as a chiropractor who, you know, believes in holistic care, uh, I said, you know, environmental health, so your physical environment, your social environment, and social determinants of health are very, very important, and we need to be involved in in everything. So that became, you know, that was very important to me. And also, uh, there was some other issues is that, you know, when it comes to uh, um, insurance reform, uh, public health is very much involved with that, and you want to be at the table when they do that. So. You know, every qualified provider uh, is something. You know, something the uh, the national you know um, chiropractic associations are have been interested in, and um, you know that trickles through into into the public health associations also. There's also other ways in that you know you meet all kinds of people in all kinds of fields. Uh, you can establish relationships, um, and uh, so I've gotten to serve on various committees that were doing, uh, you know, looking at, at literature. Uh, oh, how good is chiropractic? Uh, well, let's have Mitch join in. <laughs> Great. I met them at a, at a public health uh, association meeting, either nationally or, you know, um, here in, in the state. So, you know, very, you know, very, very important. And when you consider that this country, you know, most of our health care goes uh, does not go into public health you know, I, I forget I, I saw something a few days ago at our uh, state convention but it's you know it's like five percent or so uh, uh, go you know five percent of uh, you know federal dollars go into health care whereas you know most other countries in Europe uh, and, and North America I'm sure Australia too, and uh, probably in, 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 as well as in Asia, you um, they have far far greater um, you know contribution of of healthcare funds um, allocated you know for public health, and you know considering we don't rank well in uh, in uh, in um, in you know, I know many healthcare um, metrics that. Um, you know, this is something that uh, you know, we need more more public health, more visibility of it, and um, so the associations advocate uh, statewide, nationally, um, you know, for increasing these funds and you know for um, getting down to the nitty gritty of of uh, improving uh, of of you know everybody's everybody's health, everybody's state of wellness. Um, the other thing that I would add into that is, you know, we get down to it, you know, look at the, the, the you know, studies published in recent years. Um, we treat low back pain, musculoskeletal conditions, headaches. I mean, these are high on the list of uh, burden of disease. So um, we're talking that we are intimately involved with major public health issues. And... Uh, we should be heavily involved in the solution. Absolutely. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with uh, the back pain is number one cause of disability. And so that alone is one, one really good reason. I wanted to add also that here in Ohio, 
uh, we recently created a, an Ohio uh, a chiropractic section to public health. And so uh, we're really uh, proud of that and they're, they're doing great work. And I've been uh, a small, small part of that, but uh, uh, they're, they're really doing a great job here. So hopefully we can get uh, other state associations and whatnot to, to get involved and, and participate in, in this very important task, which is public health. And like you said, we're either at the table or we're not, and it's most definitely better to be at the table. So, um, that's great. Now, um, as well, that's fantastic. And yeah. yeah. And, uh, so maybe you'll, uh, attend, uh, um, the APHA meeting one of these years. I would love to. It's, uh, it's, uh, there'll be 15,000 people roughly there. There'll be like a thousand sessions going on, <laughs> uh, over a period of days. It's, it's, uh, it's a fantastic organization. Good stuff. As we wrap up here, I wanted to ask, um, I, I asked some people on Facebook, I let them know that I was going to be interviewing you. And I had several questions that uh, came out. And and one of them uh, that I wanted to ask was, uh, because of your interest in evidence-based practice, and this is kind of, I guess, crystal ball gazing, but um, what, what do you see as uh, students, students who are coming through college now who are interested in becoming either a chiropractor or a PT or an OT or something like that, uh, but probably chiropractic and PT since they're, uh, you know, fairly close relationships between the two. What do you see as, um, uh, you know, the, the distinctions between those two or, 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 I, I'm not sure how to phrase it exactly. Maybe why one would get into one profession versus the other at this point. Oh, wow. That's a tough one. I, I struggled with that too. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I, I can say that uh, I've, I've read uh, no studies that would inform my, <laughs> my opinion on that. Um, I love that. That's great. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, there's, th this is a, a real, you know, big uh, consideration right now. And, um, you know, you know, physical therapists do a lot of things we do. We do a lot of things physical therapists do. But I think there's some, you know, big distinctions in that, um, you know, physical therapists do a lot more rehab than we do, I would say. Now, some chiropractors out there probably do a ton and will say that I'm wrong. But uh, also physical therapists uh, are more likely to be, um, you know, to uh, have relationships in hospitals, though chiropractors do too, and that's been in increasing. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, I just say to the future students, you know, you, you look at the schools and at the programs and, and, and uh, find what, um, what uh, uh, interests you most. And then, you know, there are places like in, right, in, in Buffalo in, uh, that uh, there's a, a chiropractic and a physical therapy program. And, um, you know, in the same university, and uh, I think uh, we're going to see uh, some more of that in the next couple of years. So, you know, beyond that, uh, this, this is the question you you ask of the pundits. And, uh, <laughs> That's right. And I'm 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 a data collector. I'm not a pundit. <laughs> Well, how about we'll we'll stick with our last question here, closer to home, and uh, and that is, can, could you offer any advice to aspiring chiropractors or um, or student chiropractors uh, who wish to become chiropractic scientists? Okay, um, I think the best thing that one could do is. Um, is, is you're going to have to pick a field and, and get a, a graduate degree. So uh, whether it's, uh, you know, like an MPH, uh, probably better is, you know, a, a PhD um, is, is probably the way to go. Uh, 
can get involved uh, sometimes with um, some of the chiropractic colleges and, and work and work in in research there. Uh, there are people who uh, work with other universities uh, that that have relationships with chiropractic colleges. So you can get a PhD somewhere, and uh, you can also get some mentoring uh, from the uh, chiropractic researchers who are who are in the the universities. Like for now, uh, you know, in this country, uh, in University of Minnesota, in University of uh, Pittsburgh, and there's some other ones that uh, I, I don't have off right off the top of my head. But um, so you, you got to probably go the traditional route. Um, there are not a lot of people probably left, you know, a lot of people who are going to be able to, to get in the way I did, which is, you know, you know, get drafted and start doing research and then, and then was able to use the research I did to leverage grants. Um, it's it's much better when you know you've uh, you know you you start even you know at the PhD level where you can get a uh, um, you know grant money you know to uh, work on your uh, on your on your degrees and then um, and then then you can go right into you know getting further grants. You know once you it's like the old days. Getting a credit card, almost impossible to get one. But once you got one, then you can get more. <laughs> and, <laughs> I like uh, that. It's the same with it, it's the same with grants. So, um, and then you know, so you start with some guidance, and then you transition into be an independent investigator, and uh, and it's wide open, you know, on on what you can do. I mean, there's clinical science, basic science. You can do uh, uh, clinically related basic science, you know, biomechanics. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, there's plenty, plenty still to learn out there. And uh, you know, we're seeing more and more people getting their PhDs. And uh, frankly, um, been looking, uh, looking forward to the uh, next generation of researchers. Because one of these days, my next re I'm going to say my next research project is uh, Measuring the effects of the size of the umbrella on my umbrella drink on a beach somewhere. Uh, <laughs> that sounds really cool. Maybe I can join you. <laughs> sounds awesome. <laughs> You're more than welcome. <laughs> well, Dr. Haas, this has been uh, really fun chatting with you today. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on to the Chiropractic Science Podcast and sharing all of your wisdom and, and information about the great studies that you're doing and continue to do. So I wish you well in the future and, and thanks again for coming on. And thank you very much for having me.